and gentlemen, is the College of Complex. And this evening we will be hearing about fracking uh, in the uh, from uh, Dr. Laura Chamberlain, who uh, speaks here. I don't see... Dr. Laura, are you ready? Yes. All right. <laughs> then, uh, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Laura Chamberlain. Let's have a warm round of applause for her. Um, Oak Park, um, uh, the One Earth Film Festival. So um, it's a, a about 30 environmental films um, in and around Oak Park and in some Chicago venues. Green Community Connections. Org. And so we were firing in Oak Park. No so I am Dr. Laura Chamberlain, and I am um, one of the founders of Frac Free Illinois. We used to be the Illinois Coalition for a Moratorium on Fracking. That was last year. Uh, but we had to expand to become frack-free Illinois because there's so much to fracking. And uh, we had to have a bigger, a bigger vision, a bigger vision. So um, fracking makes me ill. This is one of our, uh, one of our buttons and one of our uh, yeah, banners and things like that, Don't Frack Illinois. Um, we work with a number of organizations across Illinois. Um, in the southern part, we work with SAFE and uh, RACE. They're the Regional Association of Concerned Environmentalists, the Shawnee Hills and Hollers, the Shawnee Sierra Club. Uh, there's, there's a lot of groups in central Illinois. We work with Illinois People's Action, Progressive Democrats of America, um, have a, a good base in Springfield. and. Um, the, um, there's several Occupy Springfield, uh, many, many of the Occupies around the state are with us on this issue, fracking, because it's very dangerous. And then up here in the north, we work with, exactly, uh, everybody we can work with, MoveOn.org, CAPA, Chicago Area Peace Section, um, the Illinois Coalition for Peace, Justice, and the Environment, uh, the Move On, I said Move On, um, uh, Illinois for Clean Water and Air. There are so many groups that it's hard to even listen. Food and Water Watch, uh, NEIS, Nuclear Energy Information Services, is interested in this issue. They and I'll tell you why about the radioactivity. Uh, there are so many groups that are involved in this issue. Sierra Club, of course, um, and some of the big greens, too. And I'll talk about that. So, um, this is my clicker. And I you just heard it. it on the right. To go forward and okay up, and then if you want a light just in the middle okay great this way. Again if you forget. okay so without your help we're fracked in <laughs> Illinois and um, th can everybody see this how's how's this turning out as far as okay great so um, we are uh, on Facebook frack free Illinois on Facebook and uh, we worked last year for a moratorium on fracking. Uh, there was a regulatory bill that was sponsored by um, pretty much everybody else in the, in the state. The unions, the big grains, the Illinois lawmakers all sponsored a regulatory bill. It is a very insufficient regulatory bill with huge holes, and I'll talk to you about that. And we came in with a moratorium. And we pushed as hard as we can. We did get um, up to 22 votes for a moratorium. It was on the last day, at the last hour of the Illinois uh, General Assembly. So we didn't have time to push it over the top. But we did um, make a lot of waves and, and got a, quite a bit concerned. There was a recent um, survey in Southern Illinois and Central Illinois. And it's running about 40% against fracking now in Southern and Central Illinois. And that was all because we uh, sounded the alarm on all of the dangerous things. We do not have to guess what's going on going to go happen here in Illinois. All we have to do is look at the states that uh, where fracking has already occurred. In Pennsylvania, it's been one of the poster childs for fracking. And this, uh, the um, Pennsylvania Alliance for Clean Air and Water have a list of the harmed. And it's a list from all over the country. It's 5,800 now and growing. These are people that have put up their stories about how fracking has harmed them. I would really recommend that you go to the Pennsylvania Alliance for Clean Water and Air and look at the list of the harm. Uh, you, it'll tell you exactly what's going to be happening here in Illinois. 
Um, and, uh, fracking. Okay, fracking is... I was just going to ask you, did you give a, a yeah. definition? Fracking I is a, def uh, a dangerous method of oil and natural gas extraction. It's extreme extraction. We are digging at the bottom of the barrel for the last drops of ancient sunlight now. And so everywhere you see extreme extraction. In West Virginia and the Appalachian, they're blowing off the tops of the mountain. In, um, in uh, the tar sands in Alberta, Canada, they're digging and they're literally wringing out the sand for the tar. And it, here, for with fracking, they're digging at the bottom of the barrel. They literally, um, and let me go on, uh, but I do want to talk about, is it, is it energy independence or is it our carbon coffin? We are fracking so many, so many wells have been dropped now with fracking that, um, and this is really is something that's coming, are you okay, sweetheart? No. You want me to do a Heimlich over there? Oh. Um, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we have dropped so many wells since 2005. 2005 is when uh, Vice President Dick Cheney exempted fracking from all of the major uh, federal <coughs> environmental legislation. And that's when they came in. They knew they were toxic. They knew they were dangerous. They knew that they had to get out from underneath those rules and regulations on the federal level to even make it legal. So um, if, if we has still had the Safe Drinking Water Act applied to fracking, they could not do it, period. So they had to exempt it. That was 2005. Cheney brought it in. And um, around 2000, they perfected the horizontal drilling. That has been a major piece of technology that has brought fracking in. So fracking is where they drill down. They can drill down up to a mile, and then they turn their drill and they drill horizontally. They typically drill about a mile, sometimes two miles. They can drill up to 10 miles horizontally. They are fracking under lakes, under rivers, under aquifers, under dams. Uh, it's amazing what they're fracking under. And um, so that was a major piece of the technology. So since 2005, 40% of our natural gas now comes from frac gas. And um, 30, about 30% of our, um, uh, we're importing, we're, we went from importing 60% of our oil to 30% now, and that is frac oil. And uh, at what cost? We haven't even had a large conversation about how, what is this costing us to get to this point. Um, energy independence is a joke. They've fully planned to ship our frac oil and our frac gas overseas. As soon as they finish the export tor terminals, it, voila. And with all of this tremendous oil and natural gas that we've discovered all over America since 2005, how many of you have had a decrease in the amount of money that you're paying at the gas pump or for your natural gas and your heating and your, and your cooking? How many? None of us, none of us have had a decrease in the cost. None of us, and you won't. You will only continue to go up. And once they start exporting it, it will go up exponentially. So this is a picture of fracking. They drill down, uh, like I said, they can drill 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 miles, 6,000. I've heard of 8,000 miles, uh, I'm sorry, 8,000 feet, 8,000 feet down. And then they can drill over a mile, two miles, up to 10 miles. Um, it takes an enormous amount of infrastructure to frack, okay? It is quite the process. And that is because they have to, um, typically for hydrofracking, for when they do a fracking for, with water, a water base to it, they use anywhere where from two to eight million gallons of water per frack. Each well can have multiple laterals coming off of it, and each well can be fracked up to 18 times. So, um, you know, just uh, like uh, five, 5 million gallons would be a, a rough estimate as far as an average for hydrofracking, and uh, you can uh, frack up to 18 times, so we're talking about somewhere around 50 to 70 million gallons of water for one well, one well. And they have to truck in tons of chemicals to mix with that. They want to make it slick water. That's, a, that's what they call it, slick water fracks. They want to make it kind of soapified. And they use, um, now it's up to 2,500 different chemicals that I've read that they can use in a mixture, a chemical cocktail, 
um, to pour into these wells. They also, tons of sand, tons of silica sand, and what they do is they put it under extreme pressure. Um, they, 9,000 PSIs, how many here are engineers? 9,000 PSI is an enormous amount of pressure. I'm sorry? Pounds per square inch. Right, pounds per square inch. So 9,000 PSI is an enormous amount of pressure. And they sho uh, shove it in these wells. Uh, first of all, they take depleted uranium. They throw down depleted uranium and they blast out parts of the rock. Then they uh, take this enormous amount of water, the chemicals in the sand, and they blast out uh, small openings in the, in the shale. Shale is a source rock for oil and natural gas. Shale is compressed dinosaurs and compressed organic material. And um, it, it exudes oil and natural gas from, uh, from the pressure, okay? So shale is kind of the carbon filter of our planet and it has collected this organic matter over millions of years and it's literally source rock for oil and natural gas. We are running out of oil and natural gas. When, typically, back in the day, when they found a pool of oil and natural gas, if they stuck a vertical well in it, they could suck out about 70 to 80 percent of the oil and natural gas in that pool. Now when they frack, they are only getting approximately 5 to 6 percent of what's down there. So they're literally sticking up uh, hundreds of thousands of straws into our shale, and they're sucking up very little each time. So they have to keep dropping wells and keep dropping wells and keep dropping wells. That's part of the problem. Um, let me see. Uh, the fissures open up and the oil and natural gas kind of trickle out. And then, they have, and then there's the storage and the compressors and the dehydrators and the, and the waste that is involved in this. And all of it involves, well, infrastructure and pipelines. This is a picture of the laterals. Okay, each box is where, um, why did that happen, the keystone? <laughs> okay. Don't worry about um, it. So each box is a well, and they can literally have multiple, multiple laterals coming out from each well. Um, basically blowing out the bedrock out of a whole area of land. And they do blow out the bedrock. Um, this, this one is from, I'm pretty sure it's from North Dakota. Pretty sure it's from North Dakota. I, I put it in here because I'm not absolutely sure. I just put uh, because of the pictures of the laterals. So it's not a picture of Illinois. Um, okay, so 2,500 different chemicals in a chemical cocktail. Uh, they, they don't use 2,500 chemicals in each well, but they can use a mixture of them, many hundreds of chemicals in each well. And each frack, remember they can frack 18 times, each frack can have a different chemical compound to it. So it's a constantly changing chemical cocktail that they're pouring down here. And um, when they get done with the, the wastewater that comes up, so a lot of this water flashes back in the first like week. It's called the flow back. But much of it, um, about 20 to 80 percent, depending on the well, stays down there. And um, they pump it out as they produce the, uh, the oil and natural gas gets pumped out. That's called produce water. That gets nastier and nastier as the time goes on. And shale has arsenic, lead, mercury, all of the heavy metals, and radioactivity. All shale is radioactive. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, radium, uranium, um, other radioactive compounds, certainly all of the decayed daughter, daughters of radium. And in Pennsylvania, what we're seeing is about half the wells are coming up 3,000 times background. So very serious radioactive waste is coming up on these frack fields. And a lot of it, too. Uh, millions of gallons. Last year, there was 280 billion gallons of radioactive wastewater produced on the frack fields that then has to be disposed of. They do a number of things with this. They shove it down class two wells. Those are called injection wells. Those are what are causing the earthquakes when they shove it under pressure in these class two wells. Um, those wells are even slightly uh, deeper than frack wells, uh, 6,000, 8,000, up to 10,000 feet, okay? We have uh, thousands of class two wells here in Illinois. Um, we also, they also can, uh, they dump it. They illegally dump it. The activists have, the activists have found them 
dumping uh, radioactive toxic wastewater in the streams, in the storm uh, water, you know, in the storm uh, drains. Um, they dump it on fields. They call it brine because it comes up really salty. And they dump it on roads as a uh, treatment. But it is radioactive. And if it was complying with the federal uh, environmental laws, it would have to be measured and it would have to be dealt with as low-level radioactive waste. So it was that, um, it was the, uh, the Halliburton loopholes, um, you know, kind of uh, giving them free reign on the federal level that really, really uh, opened the door to just a bunch of really severely environmentally toxic uh, behavior. And then the states are left to regulate it. So the feds are not regulating it, the states are regulating it. And every state is different. Every state is in a different, uh, you know, place on the fracking issue. And it totally depends on how much money is pouring into the coffers of the reps and senators of each state and the county officials. So um, they can pour it down the class two wells, they can put it on the roads and the fields, they can mix it with dry garbage. This is one of our big fears up here in Chicago, is that they can mix it with dry garbage, chopped up uh, couches and things like that, and they can call it dry, then they can call it dry garbage, and they can put it in municipal landfills, and then it leaches, radioactive elements do not go away, it leaches into the uh, groundwater around the municipal landfill, and we're even seeing that in some of the states as well. And um, last but not least, uh, the garbage in the, the oh, uh, the municipal uh, water treatment plants. They can dump it at municipal water treatment plants, and, tr and the municipal water treatment plants are not capable of taking out radioactive elements at all, nor much of the heavy metals, uh, too. So in Pennsylvania, we're seeing radioactivity uh, show up in their streams after they're dumping this stuff from the municipal treatment plant to the streams and it's uh, really becoming a problem. Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Michigan have all seen what was happening in Pennsylvania, and they've said, whoa, we've got to do something different with this waste, and they're re-examining this issue. West Virginia has uh, gone to uh, forcing them to um, build out what's called low-level radioactive waste uh, monocells in their municipal landfills so that they can hold this stuff because uh, radium, which is the chief radioactive element, it has a half-life of 1,600 years. So this is serious stuff. Um, the company, the industry will tell you, oh, don't worry about those chemicals, it's only 1%. 1% of uh, 5 to 8 million gallons is still quite a lot of chemicals. Um, 50,000 gallons of chemicals, if we uh, talk about a 5 million gallon water frack, so that's still 50,000 uh, gallons per frack, per frack. Um, Non-water fracking is extremely dangerous, and this is a really big loophole in our regulatory bill here in Illinois. They um, completely defined uh, fracking in our regulatory bill as water-based frack, 300 gallons or more, okay? And we, uh, right now, they're already fracking in Illinois. There's 22 wells. There's two wells in Clay County and 20 wells in, um, over 20 wells in White County. And what they're doing is they're doing nitrogen fracks. So the nitrogen is a gas. They uh, put it under pressure and it's kind of like a liquefied gas when they put it under pressure into the well. <coughs> then when it gets down into the um, deep layers of the earth, it gets a little warmer and it expands. That's how it cracks open the, um, the fractures, okay? It blows out. There's been a blowout already in Illinois. Um, in late January, a nitrogen frack blew out, injuring a, a worker. So it's a very uh, highly uh, volatile process that they're doing. They also use hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric how many chemists do we have here? So hydrofluoric acid is the acid that doesn't burn. And it is an extremely dangerous acid, uh, approximately 25 square centimeters. If you had contact with this uh, acid on your skin, it absorbs very quickly, and it inhibits the calcium metabolism of your heart, and it can stop your heart. There have been cases of workers that got exposed to hydrofluoric acid, and they immediately washed it off, went into the shower, washed it off, jumped into a pool, and they still die. So it is an extremely dangerous acid. And they literally are blowing it down, these wells, and melting 
the bedrock. That's what hydrofluoric acid does. And so that's, we we're extremely concerned about this. We don't know if there's a hydrofluoric acid frack right now in Illinois, but we are very, very um, concerned about this. And uh, this hole in the regulatory bill, where the bill just covers the water fracks and nothing about the non-water fracks, the reps and senators, the governor, the attorney general, all knew about it. So they are not protecting you from really serious environmental contamination. They also use propane, too, as another gas, and other gels and foams so that they don't have to, they understand that Americans are fighting over their water, so they don't, they come to these uh, techniques because they don't want to use, you know, they don't want to get in the fight over water, so they've uh, developed all these non-water, highly toxic uh, fracking methods. And uh, we were begging, begging the governor and the Illinois General Assembly to do an investigation before they regulated so that they wouldn't be bamboozled by the industry, but they were. This is a frack rig, or uh, frack path in the Marcellus Shale. They clear nine acres, uh, up to nine acres. It can be uh, anywhere from like four to nine acres. And um, they, uh, this, is, this is all of the trucks, the containing trucks, the water trucks, the sand trucks, uh, the wastewater disposal tanks that they're gonna be holding it on. So this is a typical, so you can imagine you're living in rural America and this hits your backyard. This is crazy. People are just overwhelmed by the trucking and the diesel fumes that are coming in with all of this equipment. It is industrialized fracking. That's what people don't understand in Illinois. There's, Illinois is an oil state. We have a lot of small little pumpers going in southern and uh, central Illinois and they're mom and pop, mom and pop little pumpers. They, that's what they think is happening, but that is not what's happening. This is what happens, okay? And that's just one well. They anticipate approximately over, probably over 10,000 wells in Illinois. This is the largest fracking, single fracking operation that uh, we know of, okay? Uh, 16 wells on one site, 417 million gallons of water uh, that they've used you know, all, already in, a, a, in fracking, you know, these uh, wells. Uh, this is still going on, too. Um, 78,000 tons of sand, um, 8 million gallons of fracking chemicals. Look at all this surface water around. 8 million gallons of fracking chemicals not going to leach into the surface water eventually? Give me a break. Um, uh, you know, uh, 10,000 foot laterals, that's the horizontal um, thing. It's just, it's just amazing. This is fracking, okay? <laughs> that's fracking. Where is it? Uh, that's in British Columbia. This is another reason why it, the people are in so up in arms about this, is because the fracking industry doesn't care about anybody. And they will pull up and they will put their frack pad uh, you know, right next to your uh, bathroom if they think that's going to be convenient for them. They want to spend as little as possible, so they don't want to build very many roads. They want it to be accessible. You know, they know where the deposits are, and they will, they will frack, you know, in your grandmother's lap if they could. So this is one of the problems, and this close is too close. In Illinois, another hole in our regulatory bill is they're going to allow them to frack 500 feet from a hospital, a home, any sort of dwelling, 500 feet. That is crazy. And we have plenty of evidence that that is going to endanger their health. Um, this, is the sh uh, this is the Allegheny National Forest. But this is what we think is going to happen to the Shawnee National Forest, OK? Is nine acre clear pl uh, cuts, roads, pipelines, compressor stations, that is a national forest. Now, who's going to go hiking in that forest? And how many wildlife are going to tra traverse that much infrastructure? It's, it, they're just uh, destroying our last wild places. It's amazing. This is um, out in Wyoming. It shows you the intensity of the frack pads. Okay, this is incompatible with people living there long term. And I'll tell you more about the health effects. This is the Illinois Basin. 
So um, you can see Illinois, okay? The pink is uh, where there is active uh, oil and gas producing areas. They find this stuff because they uh, look for the gamma rays, the radiation coming off the shale, okay? So they have it all mapped out. They know exactly where they're going, but they will not tell us at all. This was another thing that we wanted the investigation for with the moratorium is the Illinois reps and senators, the governor, should know exactly where they're going and exactly what they're doing, but no. They wouldn't even demand that of the industry. So the, um, this is the New Madrid Fault, the orangey, and that's the Wabash Fault. That's actually kind of small for the Wabash Fault. The Wabash Fault actually connects all the way down to the New Madrid. The Wabash Valley um, Earthquake Zone and the New Madrid Earthquake Zone are the two most active earthquake zones east of the Rockies. They are rocking and rolling all the time. And we are extremely concerned about the earthquakes being induced from the disposal of all these billions of gallons of wastewater. Um, so you can see it's kind of spread out across the state, definitely in the southeast, definitely in the central area. We're very concerned about the central um, Illinois between Peoria, Springfield, Decatur, and all the way almost to the Mississippi, okay? Um, this is uh, uh, Dr. Theo Coburn of the uh, dis uh, Endocrine Disruption Exchange was the first person to actually look at the chemicals. What are these chemicals and what are they doing? And um, she actually didn't get all of the chemicals. She only looked at 353 chemicals that where she could find uh, the CA CAS numbers, the chemical abstract service numbers, okay? And 75% of the chemicals had a serious respiratory and gastrointestinal skin effects. 40 to 50% of them are uh, a brain and nervous system, immune and cardiovascular system irritants or disruptors, and also kidney effects. And 37 of them were called endocrine disruptors, and 25% of them were carcinogen. You can't read the bottom of it. And so that was the, she was the first person that really, really looked at what was out there, and that's not even all of them. Okay. Um, the Cong Congress did look at the chemicals. Uh, they they looked at you know 29 of the most toxic chemicals, and they said, yep, 13 of them are are carcinogens. Uh, eight of them would be regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, so they couldn't use them at all. Uh, 24 of them are hazardous air pollutants, and many chemicals fell into uh, more than one category. They didn't look at all the chemicals at all. They didn't do anything with this information. They just looked at it. This is a picture of the chemicals, and the red, so the industry doesn't tell us everything that they put down these frac reds. The red barrels are, and this is a typical frac, one frac near this house, okay, of a, of a typical well. The red barrels are the mystery chemicals, the ones that we do not get to know exactly what they're doing. And then the other colors represent uh, the uh, central nervous system irritants and the endocrine disruptors. And so it, you can see it's an amazing amount of chemicals. Um, yummy, toxic stew, getting injected beneath your house. So um, it talks about the blue uh, chemicals representing hydro hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen chloride gives off chlorine gas. It's a very dangerous gas. It was used as a weapons of mass destruction in World War II. And, um, and then the mystery chemicals. Um, here are some of them. Methanol is an air toxin that is one of the volatile organic compounds that, uh, that uh, they give off. Hydrogen fluoride, that's uh, hydrogen fluoric acid. Okay, it's a systemic uh, poison. Lead, hydro hydrogen chloride, gives off chlorine gas. Pulmonary, uh, uh, serious. If you're close enough to it, it'll kill you. It's a pulmonary um, uh, irritant and also it causes pulmonary edema. Uh, two butoxyethanol is just a particularly really bad one, and it's used as a foaming agent, or a, you know, it's one of those ones that makes the water slicker. Okay, and it's uh, absorbed quite quickly. It causes ins inhalation and ingestion, and dermal um, exposure can cause problems. It can cause hemolysis and uh, severe uh, spleen, liver, and bone marrow um, abnormalities and cancers as well. I, I'm just picking out some of them, formaldehyde, diesel, BTEX 
Yeah, benzene, toluene, ethylene, benzene, and xylene, these are really serious volatile organic compounds. Some countries have uh, put these off limits. 17 countries around the world have banned it already, and hundreds and hundreds of communities have banned fracking. LA, the city of LA just passed a ban. Yay, and LA County is gonna pass a ban. Yay, exactly. So, um, it ever, there are a lot of people that are paying attention to this serious uh, environmental danger. Um, the EPA uh, hydrogen uh, sulfide, hydrogen sulfide is used, and hydrogen sulfide at even uh, just 100 parts per million can actually even cause death if you're exposed to it long enough. So this is um, the, uh, everybody complains about the rotten egg smell around the fracking, and it's hydrogen sulfide. Um, I'm going to skip this one. This is a, I, I just wanted to put it in because the EPA is not going to. They're not going to protect us, you guys. And they've already allowed 1,500 aquifers around the country to be poisoned. And Pro, uh, Pro Publica did a study on it. Um, that one of the things that they do is they keep these chemicals secret because they don't want the liability. It has nothing to do with proprietary or competition. They don't want the liability. Okay, so um, they have succeeded in having chemical disclosure uh, bills around the country, and in Colorado, it's a very serious um, loophole where they can just keep a percentage of the chemicals secret, period. They're not telling anybody it. And there was a very famous care, case of Catherine uh, Bear. She was an emergency room nurse. All she did was just cut off the clothes of a frack worker that came in uh, covered with chemicals. And she, uh, that's all she did. She wasn't working on him, uh, you know, uh, a lot. She just uh, cut off his clothes, prepared him for the doctors to look at him, and she went into organ failure. And the frackers would not give her doctors the names of the chemicals that she was exposed to. She lived. She, uh, she pulled through. But this is unacceptable. There is no other industry in America that does this. If you are injured on any other industry, you're injured on the job, you have a chemical exposure, you show up into the emergency room with the medical service data sheet, okay, the MS, uh, DS, uh, medical safety data sheet, excuse me, and that uh, industry has to, tell, uh, has to tell the doctor everything that you were exposed to. This is crazy. And in Illinois, the secrecy continues. They made a lot of uh, brouhaha about how we've got the best bill in the nation. It is total bullpucky. The, um, in the Illinois, the uh, frackers are going to tell the DNR everything that they use. They're going to be able to keep a percentage of them, a small percentage of them, uh, trade secrets. And then if you get injured, the doctors and the nurses are going to have to call the IDNR or call the frackers and prove to them that they need to know what you were exposed to. Like uh, an emergency room doctor has that much time, right, when they're trying to save your life if you've had a serious chemical exposure. And then they have to sign non-disclosure non -disclosure agreements. This is unacceptable. And every single doctor I talk to, the only reason why the doctors are not up in arms is because they don't know about this, in, you know, the, in, in large numbers. But every single doctor I know, especially the ER doctors, are like, bullshit, <laughs> I am not going to do this. So we, uh, I'll talk to you about our bills that we have. So that is... Um, it's, absolutely, it's just unacceptable. When you hit the ER, and remind you, this is going to be not only frack workers, but it's going to be people, um, normal people too, because the number one thing that happens on and around the frack uh, fields are truck accidents. And people are getting killed, families are you know, getting uh, exposed to a bunch of stuff when the trucks roll over, and there is a massive amount of dumping and spilling that are occurring on these truck accidents. The frack fields are not even investigated by OSHA, so they're pulling a bunch of uh, BS, meaning that they're uh, making the drivers drive longer than they normally have, uh, they normally can under OSHA regulations, and so it's extremely dangerous around these frack fields. Um, once they start, once they start uh, fracking, then up comes a. a bunch of volatile organic compounds. It comes up from the well, it comes up from the open pits that kind of hold the wastewater, uh, it, 
they say temporarily in Illinois, but I'll talk to you about that. That's another huge a loophole. Mm -hmm. So it comes off of these open pits. It's coming off of compressors. It's coming off of um, dehydrators. Um, every single piece of infrastructure exudes volatile organic compounds. Those are the benzenes, the toluenes. They're the, um, the hydrogen uh, sulfide comes off of that as well. Um, and it's gotten so bad in some areas that are heavily fracked that they're literally causing smog in these rural areas. Like rural Wyoming had worse, or rural Utah had uh, uh, air that was worse than LA in a rural area. And it's because of all of this volatile organic compounds coming up, mixing with nitrous, uh, nitri nitrous oxide, and then forming smog. So there's a very serious air pollution problem around the frac uh, rigs. And they're, it's, uh, when they're flaring, they're releasing a lot of volatile organic compounds. The flaring only burns up the methane, okay? It doesn't burn up the radon, which is radioactive uh, decay from the radium. It doesn't burn up um, the many of the, the other um, organic compounds. So the, a tremendous amount is just flowing off of these uh, fires as well. Um, so the water pollution is really bad. Uh, uh, Professor Ingrafia of Cornell in uh, Institute has told us that 5% of the wells will leak um, right away. They'll leak right away. And if they start to leak, then that is where we can start to see water contamination. 50% of the wells will leak within 10 to 15 years. 100% of the wells will leak eventually. So within 30 years, 100% of the wells will leak. So everywhere they're dropping them, they're going to be leaking methane to the air and also a conduit for um, contamination of water uh, in the area. Um, so the water pollution is really bad. It takes a little while. The air pollution is right away. And that is what is really getting people sick. And, um, you know, Charles has this on his computer, my PowerPoint presentation. If anybody here is a doctor or really wants to dive into this stuff, um, I'm sure he could send this to you. Because any, every one of these links um, is you can follow for even more information. Um, the setbacks are way too close. And that is, setback is how far away they can uh, have the frat rigs. So the Colorado School of Public Health did the first kind of really large, long-term, I'm sorry, not long-term, but large study. And they found that people were getting sick within a half mile of every well. And um, they're getting, it's mostly respiratory, asthma, um, ca worsening cardiovascular disease, uh, neurological problems, uh, but it's from the air pollution. So they get sick from the air pollution first. Um, 15 million people now live within one mile of a frack rig. So this is a lot of people that are going to get sick. So a half mile. And then recently a, um, a woman, uh, did, a public health uh, specialist, did some studies about um, lo uh, prenatal, uh, gestational uh, size and gestational well-being. And she's finding also that within... Um, 1.5 miles of a frac rig, if you're pregnant, then people are seeing low, small gestational age and also low APGARs, if you're a doctor, if you know what that is. But basically, poor fetal well-being and small for gestational age. So the mother's breathing this stuff is, is not a good idea either. And of course, the wind direction is a real, real big issue, but the wind also moves. And uh, some people have lit literally been evacuated from their homes because the volatile organic compounds and the methane has been so um, seriously uh, elevated in their homes that it became an actual emergency. There actually have been some uh, homes that have blown up too because the methane in their homes became so high that it got ignited. So there has been uh, blowouts. There's a very famous blowout in Pennsylvania. A uh, family's um, home blew up and it killed the baby. It killed the mother and father and the baby as well. Um, the sand is a real, real issue. So this is a frac sand mine, okay? The frac sand uh, mining in um, Ottawa, Illinois, in LaSalle County around Starved Rock. There are six to seven sand mines right now in and around that area, and 70 companies want to come in there. 
So this is that area around Starved Rock. Starved Rock, if they let them do this, Starved Rock will be a little, a little island of green around that. That's what they want to do is just rip up the bluffs. And this is a tremendous um, carcinogen. Silica sand is like little shards of glass. And you breathe it in, they're really fine. And people are getting sick. There's a higher incidence of lung cancer in this area, and people are getting uh, sick from this already in, in and around LaSalle County. They're fighting back. Many, many of uh, the residents are fighting back. But again, there's so much money involved. So uh, we, we, really, we really need your help here in Illinois. We're really getting it on, from all sides. Um, in Wisconsin is the frac sand uh, capital of the world now. And this is one frac sand mine. Uh, you can see that they're, I mean, who's going to remediate that? It's going to be a barren wasteland after they're done. Um, they've created 19,000 uh, jobs in Wisconsin, but it's uh, hundreds of frac sand mines, and uh, people are fighting back in Wisconsin as well because around these frac sand mines, what, what uh, Dr. Pierce up from the University of Wisconsin is telling us is two miles around this sand mine, people are getting sick. They're getting respiratory disease. So that is a lot of people as well. Um, this is all about Wisconsin. And they, they build these little mounds of dirt around, the, around these huge 500-acre uh, sand mines uh, so that you don't see them. Okay, that's what it's all about. It doesn't do anything about protecting people. It's just so you don't see them. <laughs> This is of the exposure on the frac field. So fracking is uh, eight times more dangerous than any other job in America now. 138 frackers died last year. Many, many more were injured, and many are getting sick. This is the silica exposure on a frac sand uh, pad. And uh, we have many reports that the industry is not giving the workers respirators, uh, face masks, they're charging you for uh, hazmat suits, so if you're um, cleaning out the, uh, the tanks that hold the radioactive uh, wastewater, they're charging you if you want any protective gear. Uh, these guys are really cheap, and they're nasty, and they're cheap, I'm telling you, the frackers are. And so this is, it, this is uh, OSHA already has put out a warning about it, but with hundreds of thousands of wells, OSHA is not going out to the frac pads. They are not visiting and, and finding anybody. This is what happened in Colorado. This is uh, a very, very important thing about Illinois. We have a lot of 100-year floodplains. And um, in Colorado, it was really a mess after the floods this fall. And um, uh, over 43,000 gallons of produced toxic radioactive wastewater entered the rivers and 48,000 uh, gallons of um, oil. One of our bills, we have uh, 12 bills, we have a green dozen, and then we just added a, a 13th, so we have the green 13. One of our bills is to slow down, no fracking in the floodplains, and let's see what, Ohio, what uh, Colorado discovered from their experience with the recent flooding and how to secure this stuff but because you can see if there's an open pit of uh, you know millions of gallons of wastewater it's gone right it's totally gone blowouts fires spills accidents um, most of the blowouts and the fires are really really severe and they a lot of them they have to call in Texas uh, well fighters uh, firefighters to come in, they fly them in. So a recent uh, fire in Pennsylvania, blowout of one of the wells and a fire, the uh, firefighters were kept a half mile from the fire for over two days. They couldn't even get closer than that. So we're letting them frack 500 feet from somebody's home and the firefighters can't even get within a half mile of these places. This is crazy, okay? It's extremely dangerous. And this is one of the fires, just to show you, you know, what happens. Uh, blowouts are very, very common. Uh, f fires are very, very common. A a truck accidents are extremely common. Injuries are off the wall on these frac fields. Uh, there's falls, there's chemical spills, uh, you name it, it's happening on the frac fields. So I hope nobody here is thinking that they're going to go and work for the frackers. We highly don't recommend it. Um, 
The, this is a, a, a chart about the 138 workers that were killed. It's eight times more dangerous than any other job. They're temporary and toxic. One of the things that is happening is uh, that the industry is out there saying, we're going to create so many jobs. Here in Illinois, they said, oh, there's going to be 1,000 jobs to 47,000. That was their estimate, 1,000 to 47,000. Let me tell you, it'll be more like 1,000. What we've seen in the other states is that 1.7 to 4 jobs per well are created, and only one of them is longer than a couple months. So they're temporary, they're toxic, and only one is longer than a couple months. So, so much for that. But what happens is they bring in a bunch of transient workers for a very short time when they're fracking, and it drives up the rents in the areas, driving up people that are on fixed incomes, like the elderly, drives up the cost of food, drives up the cost of all of the uh, you know goods and services, the gas and things in the area. Um, we have seen increased crime, increased uh, sexual violence, increased prostitution, drugs in these areas. The Balkan oil field is, is a prime example of this. And um, last year in the spring, uh, National Geographic did a great article about the Balkan oil field in North Dakota, about you know really what's happening to these people's uh, rural lifestyles. And I highly recommend that you um, you look at that. I also I have a radio show. It's called All In for Mother Earth. It's a uh, internet radio show, and we're also on AM uh, 1710. And I was recently interviewing um, Candy Musset, who is from the Indian, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Indigenous Environmental Network, and she lives near the Balkan oil field. And the corruption is so bad that they've literally had murders of elected officials in the Balkan, in and around the Balkan area. Apparently somebody was not so cool with something the frackers were doing, and they, they showed up dead. So it, a nasty element just moves in to our rural communities, and it can get very nasty. So I highly uh, recommend people to look up that, especially if you have uh, friends and neighbors in central and southern Illinois. This was the uh, big frack uh, oil uh, train wreck in Quebec. And, or I'm, I'm sorry, I think this one was in, um, it was in Canada, but I think it was in Alberta. It wasn't, it, this is not the Quebec one. But there has been, there has been uh, explosions of these trains that are carrying this frack oil, you know, several times over the last uh, couple months. And the problem is, is that these, uh, this frack oil has a very high percentage of volatile organic compounds in it. So it's very explosive and they're not carrying it in appropriate uh, tank trucks. And there are some reports that not only, these are not uh, trains that are getting derailing, derailed, and then they blow up. They're blowing up first and derailing the plane, uh, the train, derailing the train. Wow, okay. <laughs> gotta have a cup of coffee to say that. So this is, it. and they're gonna be pulling this stuff, and they already are pulling this stuff through Chicago. This is going around America, the trucking of the frack oil, and it'll only get worse. So one of the things that is happening is that there's a big fight about the Keystone XL pipeline, right? Okay? All of these pipelines, all of the pipelines, including Keystone XL, what they do is they shoot a big air bubble through these pipelines, and they can run frack oil through the pipelines, they can run uh, the tar sands oil, they can run natural gas. They, so all of them can be used for all of these different products. And that is one of the reasons why that they want that pipeline is because um, they, were, they know that they're going to have to pay more to ship this, um, this frack oil by train because um, Canada's cracking down and the U.S. Department of Transportation is cracking down as well. Um, all shale is radioactive, uh, anywhere from 30 times background to 3,000 times background. 3,000 times background is serious radioactivity, and even the EPA has say, says that workers are at risk, people that live around there are at risk, and they're at risk for inhalation of this radioactive material, ingestion of it, and direct exposure as well. Even, this is from the EPA's own site, even 50 miles from the frac site, or where they're holding this toxic radioactive waste, you still have exposure to it. 
So uh, we are going to have trucks full of radioactive waste uh, barreling down our highways, I guarantee it. Um, the, the major holes in the regulatory bill, I already told you one about the, it only covers hydraulic fracturing, not the rest of it. Uh, the chemical disclosure is completely unacceptable in the regulatory bill. The, they don't, what they say is that the, uh, the waste is going to be tested once in the flowback period. That's the first week of this water flowing back. Remember I told you that that was, and that's kind of splashback. That's not so radioactive. It's the produced water that comes up over the lifetime of the well, uh, over the two to three years of the lifetime of the well, that stuff gets really nasty. And so they have a loophole for that. They're only going to test it for radioactivity once in the very beginning. And um, they, don't, they do not declare it low-level radioactive waste. And um, even IEMA is concerned about this. We've had discussions with them. So even they are concerned about it, but they were cut out of the regulatory bill. And um, the, other, the other big hole is the earthquakes. There, the earthquakes, there has been a hundredfold increase in earthquakes in the mid-continent area of uh, the U.S. And it's all because of fracking and the disposal of wastewater. The seismologists absolutely have proven it now. They know that this is happening. It's called induced seismicity. We have industry white papers on induced seismicity. What happens is fracking itself can cause small earthquakes, up to around 2, 2.5, okay? Because they're deep, and they're sending uh, depth charges down, you know, deep into the uh, bedrock. But the disposal of these billions of gallons of wastewater, that is really what's causing these earthquakes. So they take it and they shove it under pressure into class 2 wells, and even in dormant um, earthquake areas, like in Oklahoma, they had a 5.7 earthquake in 2011 in Prague, Oklahoma, and that was in a dormant earthquake area. And what they think is happening, the Columbia University really studied that earthquake, and they think it, uh, all of this um, slick water is being shoved into these areas, and it's increasing what's called poor pressure. It's just a seismology uh, you know, term. But it's basically, you can kind of think of it as they're, you know, slicking up the fault lines. And then an 8.8 .8 earthquake happened in Chile. And there was a wave through the Earth's crust, and that is what set off the 5.7. So that earthquake, that, and they, were, they were using that disposal well for, um, a, you know, a several years before that earthquake happened. So they think that we are setting ourselves up for even earthquakes down the line. Not just even directly like they pressurize the water, put it into the well, and then an earthquake gets stimulated. But years down the line, we could have more earthquakes. It is crazy that we're going to let them do this in those uh, active earthquake zones in southern Illinois. And um, the, this is the Scientific American. This is a really good article uh, from Columbia University about that whole mechanism on how we could have uh, large earthquakes even later on just by all of this slick water being down there. This is the graph. Um, this is a, uh, one of our friends in southern Illinois wrote this paper, so I wanted to give him a call out. His name is Brent Ritzel, and it's Fracking, Industrialization, and Induced Earthquakes. You can Google it and read it. It's really a good paper. But this is the graph. This is 1970. That's 2010. Those are the increase in the earthquakes in the mid-continent uh, mid area, which is us. So there you have it. <laughs> um, it all of these wells will leak methane. And this is a real serious problem for climate change. Um, methane is, uh, initially, in the first uh, couple decades, it's 100 times more potent than CO2. And every single one of the wells will leak sig significant methane. Um, they have been measuring them. In Grafia, pres uh, Professor in Grafia has been measuring this. Two to three percent leakage of methane from every well makes it as dirty as coal. Okay, as dirty as coal for the climate. But what we're finding is it's more like six to nine percent is leaking from these wells, and more and more wells will be leaking. They want to drill 1.2 million more wells across America. So this is going to be an enormous source of greenhouse gases, 
and already the oil and natural gas industry is the number two uh, industry for greenhouse gases in the United States. Um, if we burn all this frack oil, we are fracked, okay? I'm sure you guys know about this. The IPCC told us that we have to leave. We can only use 20 to 25% of the known carbon reserves. That's oil, natural gas, coal, and, you know, pet coke, any of it. We can only use 20 to 25% by 2050 or else we're at four degrees warming and we all are getting malaria. Uh, up here in Chicago. That means Boston is underwater, South Florida is gone, Orange County is gone. We are at a serious crossroads for, um, for the climate and I would really hope everybody would pay attention to this. It's important. Yeah, our children's future is at stake here. Um, so we think that fracking is a bridge to a catastrophe and um, one of the things that I think I have it here, um, MIT did a study and they looked at whether fracking, all this investment in fracking, was inhibiting our renewable energy future, and it is. It is diminishing the investment that's going into uh, tidal and solar and wind and energy efficiency. So we cannot go down this frack path. And um, I would really uh, highly recommend that uh, everybody here get involved in this issue or the tar sands issue. One of the issues that is the fight against the, global, uh, the climate change, we, um, we are facing a huge, huge industry. How many, here people, how many people here know that yesterday, I think it was yesterday or Thursday, Ukraine signed a $10 billion dollar uh, deal with Chevron for fracking in Ukraine. So one of the first things the new government does is sign a deal with Chevron. <laughs> Give me a break, you guys. They, these wars, these revolutions are being fomented by our own government and other go Western governments to um, sequester and bring under control the last remaining uh, deposits of oil and natural gas. That it's just incredible. That government is not even elected and they're making the deal with Chevron. So, you know, this is a huge industry and it's got its tentacles everywhere. So we could really use your help. This is a list of the jobs, or oh, cut off um, uh, efficiency. But you can see that oil and natural gas is not the most job intensive um, industry out there. Wind and solar uh, create far more jobs, building retrofits, 11.9. Um, so if we really move to our renewable energy future, which is absolutely our energy independence, not oil and natural gas, but, uh, but renewables, if we move there, we could really create some jobs and we would really turn this economy around. And this is uh, jobs created per one million um, invested, basically. I really, I'm not going to talk about this, but Deborah Rogers of the Energy Policy Forum, she talks about the economics of fracking, and there's a whole, uh, there's a Ponzi scheme going on with the investing in this fracking stuff. I know you guys have seen all of the investment ads all over YouTube and all over Facebook and everything. Um, do your homework. If you're thinking about investing in fracking, do your homework. Go to Deborah Rogers of the Energy Policy Forum, and she'll talk about it. Yep. Exactly. I'm almost done. So they're f oh, fight back. The fight back. So New York still has a moratorium. They are having to fight constantly to keep their moratorium. It's going on in their in the seventh year, and they're doing an investigation. I am sure the New Yorkers will not allow fracking to move forward in New York. This is uh, their they they've got some money people in their campaign, which is great. I love them. And there are uh, millions of people, their drinking water is at risk. Uh, New York gets their drinking water from reservoirs in the mountainous uh, north part of New York, and they are not going to let them frack anywhere near that water. So uh, thank God for Yoko and Sean Ono. We love you. Um, here in Illinois, we have, uh, so we have this lousy regulatory bill, and uh, it went to the IDNR, and the IDNR had to interpret this, 
the IDNR is the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. They came out with really egregious rules. There were $50 fines for the frackers for dumping radioactive toxic waste in a stream, okay? There were, uh, they could cause four, 4.9 level earthquakes before calling a halt on a uh, disposal well. 4.9 level earthquakes are toppling chimneys, your children are falling out of bed, things are falling out of your cabinets, your walls are cracking, your foundation is cracking. Four of them, okay? I mean, it was over the top. They were the most ridiculous rules I've ever read. We've done some investigation. They hired an industry front group to write the rules so that they wouldn't be liable. We're tracking that down. And um, we got, uh, there was five uh, public hearings, there was a public comment period, we got over 40,000 comments into the IDNR, and uh, thousands of people were uh, testifying. And uh, Charles told me I could go just a little over, and I'm almost done. So um, thousands of people testified, and what we got was the IDNR, they're looking at the rules now. They're looking at them again, okay? And the governor got hit by, a, a, you know, a lot of bad press. And uh, JCAR, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules of the General Assembly, they're the ones that are going to have to approve this, these rules, eventually. We're asking them to prohibit the rules. We want to send them back for a full rewrite. This is crazy. And uh, so we would welcome your help in uh, contacting them. They're up on the, uh, if, you, uh, if you Google JCAR, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, up will come the 12 uh, Illinois lawmakers that are a uh, member of that um, administrative body. And uh, so then what we did is we wrote uh, Frack Free Illinois as a number of uh, you know activists across the state. We wrote 12 uh, fracking bills and I'm going to uh, if, if you want to come up here afterwards, there are a couple of flyers and things that you can take. So we have the Green Dozen fracking bills, and we just added a third one. Sierra Club did write a bill for um, no fracking on the public lands, okay? The, um, so that would be the Shawnee National Forest and the state parks, okay? So now we're on the Green 13. And we've covered everything. We want to ban it in the earthquake zones. We want to um, treat the radioactive waste as low-level radioactive waste. We're redefining fracking. We're, the floodplains are off limits. The Mohammed Aquifer in the central part of um, Illinois is off limits. So uh, you can see that we have a number of uh, bills. We do have some support in the General Assembly. We're absolutely going down again for a big lobby day on April 3rd. We would welcome everyone to come down with us. We'll teach you everything we know. Um, uh, we have a Facebook page. It's Frack Free Illinois. And if you go on that Facebook page, um, I have all sorts of videos and um, uh, podcasts and things like that to teach you everything about fracking. Uh, 1 217 782 2000 is your number to your Illinois rep and senator, and we're asking you to uh, ask them for the green 13. We appreciate it very much if uh, they would sponsor them and support them. And uh, we're asking for people's help. And we also have DVDs up here of Gasland One if you want to show it to your groups and things like that, and buttons. And I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, no. right, thank okay. you very much. All right. All right. One more bowl, because that was delicious. One more bowl? Uh, well, whatever right, you want. You want some bread? Uh, salad? First of all, let's, uh, okay, who has, who has house. questions? Um, Garlic? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, ma'am? Jan. Jan, yes, yes, go ahead. Ask, your, ask away. Oh, I wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Laura covered everything that I was thinking she might be about, but except she... She okay. One All right. Uh, uh, excuse me. I just, I just want to. Excuse me, ma'am. I, I want to just say that this is actually a time for, for uh, questions, not for rebuttals. Butter. Now, th this is okay. Butter, butter, butter. Okay, go ahead. I left out something. Oh, man. Uh, one of the things that she didn't mention. Give is her the mic, Don. Okay, here. The shale layer in Illinois is much more shallow than shale layers everywhere else. Marcellus shale is deep. The Illinois shale is shallow, and so when it is fracked, they, 
the uh, fracking companies are not going to use water, and therefore the rules that were made for hydro fracking don't even apply, and they're the rules that are written in Illinois. And um, uh, then there was another thing about good jobs. In places around Peoria and Ottawa, there are good jobs connected with tourism because people go down there to go to to go to um, Starved Rock. I've done it myself. I've stayed in the lodge, and now they're putting frac sand mines all around uh, Starved Rock. They don't know what's going to happen to the water. They, you know, there's no way of telling what will happen to the aquifers. And um, I went down to uh, uh, Utica for a for a city council meeting, and the. The uh, testimony against sand fracking was extensive, and the city council still voted for it. Not the people, the city council. Okay, all right. That, that will be our one pre-rebuttal rebuttal for the evening. <laughs> all right, um, all right. Now, who actually has a question? Uh, that, that is, you know, a question that ends with, a, that, that actually involves unknown information and ends with a question mark. Uh, those who have a question, please raise your hand. And, and, and excuse me, Laura, uh, remember also that, uh, quite, that this is a time for questions, not for speeches. Okay, uh, sir. Uh, what does the uh, Illinois governor say about this? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Laura. I'll tell you what, you take the mic. Okay, great. So um, the governor um, ran around his uh, mansion after he saw Gasland saying, what are we doing about gas? You know, what are we doing about fracking? But um, very early in the game, uh, he caved completely to the industry and he was for the regulatory bill, even though he knows that there's a huge, huge holes in it. And, um, and she, uh, the, and um, Jan is exactly right. We do have a real shallow shale, so that's why we think that the water fracks, the deep water fracks, are not going to happen here in Illinois as much. That's why we're saying about three fourths of the fracking will not be covered at all by the regulatory bill. All right, um, you're, you're you gonna keep the microphone, okay. but I'll and I'll yeah. call on people. Mike, uh, you said 138 um, folks died. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Last year. On, on one year. Yeah, one year. And yep. what's the uh, what's the uh, cause? What, what what happens? Oh, the mostly breathing? oh the breathing and no actually fires and blowouts and ex truck accidents and falls. Those are the ones that are killing them. There's a lot of injuries as well, and a lot of sickness as well. There, those are uh, less do well documented. So the deaths, the 138 deaths, were blowouts, fires, um, uh, truck accidents, and falls and injuries on the field. All right. Um, I see a lot of hands up. Sir, you in the back. Yes. Uh, you mentioned in the very beginning of your talk about depleted uranium. Now, depleted uranium is the spent material from uh, the uranium with, for, for powering up the reactors. Now, they use depleted uranium weapons like for bunker buster bombs and things in Iraq and all of that. Tell me, how, what are they actually doing with this, this yeah. depleted uranium? You, you know that, uh, that big uh, drill, you know, the pipe going down and around? They send the depleted uranium charges down to um, open up, to blow out the uh, rock Initially, like at the end of the, the at the end of the drill, so they finish drilling, and then they want to open it up a little bit. They'll send depleted uranium down to do that, and then they open it up more by sending the water, sand, and chemicals down. Okay. So it's the first uh, initial blast. When you're on top of the ground, you can actually feel that those uh, detonations underneath. All right, uh, sir, you have a question. Yeah. Um, where does the water come from yeah. that they're using to put down the wells, and how is that affecting local aquifers? Absolutely. So, um, so uh, uh, sometimes they have a deal with the farmer, and sometimes the farmer doesn't even know it, the landowners. There's a whole uh, aspect of this that I didn't tell you about, where the surface owners um, may not own their mineral rights. It's called split estate. And so the mineral rights owner um, signs the lease to have their mineral, you know, their oil and natural gas drilled for, but the surface owner, they they just have to accept it on their land, and the industry just throws them a chump change, five to ten thousand dollars for an easement right, and then boom, they are fracking on their land. Sometimes in those leases, it says that the water can come from the farmer's land, 
Some at times they are pulling it directly from uh, public sources. They're buying it from uh, public municipal water systems. They're also dr uh, taking it directly from rivers and streams. In uh, Texas, 30 towns have gone dry over the last year. Did you know that? And they were in a heavy drought, and they let the frackers use every last drop. And they literally are dry. So they, many of the aquifers are in real danger because of that overuse. The EPA is in the middle of a study right now looking at water usage because so much of this is happening in Texas and in uh, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, very dry areas of the, of the, um, the country. One of the things that the frackers have done in response to that water use issue is that they've been re, they, they take all this wastewater that comes up and they hold it in these containers and they're re-injecting it. So it's becoming more and more and more toxic as they re-inject it and it comes back up and they re-inject it and comes back up. But they're, they are, they know that the fight is over water. So they've been kind of um, uh, doing different things because of that. So uh, it's, it's a number of places, and it's all, you know, money to the county officials for water draws, you know. Okay, Tim, did you have a question? Dr. Laura. Yeah. I like driving cars. I like getting across the Atlantic in less than a day. I like our industrial society. Okay. And, you know... We can't afford your... We cannot no longer, as a society, as a, as a world, afford your taste. Sorry about that. We can. Sorry. It is. I'm serious. We, you can move around the country and move across the oceans with renewable energy. All of it can be replaced. Mark Jacobson from the Stanford High Atmospheric um, Energy Association has um, is developing uh, maps roadmaps for every single state how they can get renewable energy how they can get off even with transportation so electric cars where can we get natural gas because we are going to need some natural gas for some things okay like i hear that beer has to have the flame to to be able to be brewed in the right way okay so we are only tapping 10 percent of our renewable methane from our landfills from our CAFOs, those big animal uh, feedlots, right? Um, there is methane that we need to tap because we can't let it go into the into the atmosphere. We might as well use it, okay, that are renewable. So we have to do that. That's one way of getting natural gas. Oil is now being generated from algae. So, and it's a very clean oil. It still, it still puts carbon dioxide in, but apparently it's a, it is a, um, a complete cycle in that the algae uh, take in carbon dioxide, make the, um, make the carbon uh, links in their bodies, and then we compress it for oil, and then it's a, a cycle. So it's a kind of a sustainable cycle. So that's one aspect of uh, getting oil, because I know we have, to, we have to diminish our use of fossil fuels. But we can't be doing it slowly to right, everybody's right. comfort. We have to do it quickly. And um, many, many, many environmentalists no longer fly because that is way too consumptive of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, all right, ma'am, did you have a question? Yeah. Have you uh, taught or gone to pension funds and foundations and asked them to stop funding fracking? Uh, yeah, so um, 350.org has been doing that at the colleges and also at some um, pension funds. That's one of their big... Uh, movements with the college kids is divestment, and they have included uh, fracking in their divestment schemes. So that is definitely one thing that they're doing. We, um, Frack Free Illinois, we are one of our specialty. Everybody is doing a slightly different thing um, as far as the groups around the state, okay? Some people are doing direct actions. Some people are doing these local initiatives. We have a kind of a specialty. We have a lot of in to the General Assembly. So that's why we wrote bills and we're lobbying. But there are people that are working on that aspect. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry, one, one point. Got to keep moving. Um, sir, you had a question. Yeah, you were saying about uh, truck accidents with this, with this, this truck accident. Uh, uh, and all kinds of freight. Right. 
So I am a truck driver. Okay, yeah, we, we understand. It's, a, it's about the concentration of the trucks. So on the fact fields, there's over a thousand truck trips to each path in these rural communities, in these small country roads. They're pushing the truck drivers. You can only drive for 16 hours, and then you have to stop, no. correct? Well, uh, what is the time? You're only allowed to drive for uh, 11 hours, and you would then have to have uh, a 10-hour break. That You're thinking of the old rules. The DOT right. has completely rewritten these rules. And every few years they're doing it again. Exactly. Okay. But I want you to know that the truckers on the, the frat fields are not abiding by that at all. We all have right. many reports all that right. they're pushing them farther than that. They're driving 20 hours without a break. All right. Uh, sir, you had your hand up for a while. Um, uh, the, um, in graphic presentation, you mentioned yeah. that outstanding presentation, yeah. uh, said that the percentage of these fracking worlds are actually turning a profit was extremely small. Yeah. How come there's so many people trying to lose their money there? Yeah, so the natural gas, the methane, um, and here in Illinois we're going to be fracking mostly for oil and a little bit for methane, okay? We don't know exactly the ratio. We suspect um, maybe uh, about eight times more wells for oil than methane. Dry gas, which is methane, is actually losing money right now because they have brought up so much from the Marcellus Shale and some of the others that they uh, there's a glut and they don't have the export terminals that they want to get this stuff into liquid natural gas and ship it over to Europe. We're blocking those efforts too. It's all about getting this natural gas and this oil to the European and Asian markets. I want you to know that has nothing to do with you. They don't care about you at all. And um, so the dry gas is losing money. And so what they're doing is uh, uh, the number of wells for dry glass has diminished. Dry gas has been diminishing. And um, the uh, because they produce so little in each well that it depends on how much it costs them to drill it, whether they're going to make money or not, we think most of the oil wells will make at least a little money, okay? And um, when I said that the wells last about uh, three years, that's the typical lifespan of a well now, a frack well, and then they're, then they're done. Then they, they can't get any more oil and natural gas up. That is the average. Sometimes they're, they're going dry at one year, okay? So that's the average. And that's why, that's why they have to keep dropping wells, keep dropping wells, keep dropping wells. All right. Uh, all right, Andy, do you have a question? Yes, I have a follow-up question. Have, uh, do you know, who can you tell us point to studies? I want to know why they use depleted uranium for the explosive rather than some other safer explosive that's non-radioactive. Yeah, I don't know why. I think it's cheap. And I, I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, the other thing is, is that I, I'm not absolutely sure. Where will we, we find out? Um, you can, if you look up depleted uranium on the frac uh, fields, you can find that they're doing it, okay? The industry doesn't tell us. They don't call me up and talk to me about, hey, would you mind if we do this or that? <laughs> they don't do that. You mean the natural industry? Exactly. Exactly. So I, so I can't really, I don't know why they're not using other... Forms right. of detonation. Right. Uh, Joe, did you have a question? Besides the major oil companies, who are the fractors? Okay, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely the major oil companies. Um, Exxon, they're the top. Then they have subsidiaries and subsidiaries. Halliburton is the drilling. They, they are drilling all over the place, and they're going to be drilling here, too. And they have subsidiaries. Strata X is going to be drilling in Illinois. They already are drilling in Clay County. And they are a subsidiary of Halliburton. So you go back to the big guys, okay? And recently, the CEO of Exxon, Rex Tillerson, uh, put in a lawsuit because they were going to build a water tower for fracking water too close to his McMansion in Texas. And so he's like, oh, no, no, you can't do that. And so they've got a lawsuit on it. So the funniest thing is some Canadian fractivists sent uh, Rex Tillerson, the CEO of Exxon, a fracking toolkit to uh, you know empower him to become a fractivist <laughs> in this area. Sure. Okay. Uh, all right, ma'am, do you have a question? Well, water is contaminated down on the land.
Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's no question about it. Um, I recently, on one of my radio shows, I talked to Doug Shields, who is the a former uh, president of the Pittsburgh City Council, and I asked him about that. I said, "What's going on with the wildlife in Pennsylvania? Because you can see their habitat is getting destroyed, and there's all these open pits that they can get into." And he said, "They're they're showing up dead. They're showing up floating dead in these open pits." There's no question about that, that, that the numbers of deer and wildlife have diminished greatly. The hunters are reporting that. In fact, now in Pennsylvania, they've been um, being fracked since 2005, and they're kind of the poster child. 70% of Pennsylvania want to put moratorium. They're done, okay? And a very large contingent of that are the hunters, because they're saying that the wildlife is so affected. Um, they're drinking this poison water, and they're breathing in this poison air. Their habitat's getting destroyed, and it's, it's absolutely lowering the numbers. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Is there just a, just a moment, sir? Oh, Carol, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hasn't uh, fracking been around in some form since like the night? Okay. This is a meme from the industry. Um, fracking. They what they call fracking is just sending stuff under down a well under pressure. Okay. The thing that makes our fracking, the, the fracking that's happening right now, the difference is the industrialization of it. The depth of the wells and also the horizontal leg. That did not come in until after 2000. And that makes it that it's more pressure, it's 9,000 psi, it's way more water, chemicals, sand, it's on a whole different level. Okay. Before, there would be a vertical well, and if it stopped producing, they would send down some chemicals to that vertical well, and it wouldn't be under such uh, extreme pressure. It wouldn't be the massive amounts of chemicals that they're using now. So that's the difference. So that's a meme of the industry. Beware of what the oil and natural gas industry says. It typically is not true. All right. Uh, all right. Now... Uh, I noticed one or two people have their hands up who had a question before, but is there anybody who has a question? Is Kevin over here? Well, well, just a moment. Oh, now, now, Laura, no, I, no. Uh, let me uh, call on the people. Okay, okay, I'm just telling you. All right, name. all right, all right. All right. <laughs> well, well, we can spend the rest of All right, now, is there anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? All right, Pam. <coughs> yeah, your, your figures on injuries and stuff, especially from the silica dust and everything, how did the, how did, how do the injuries and the health effects compare to data and injuries and the health effects around non fracking wells, around traditional conventions? Oh, there is just no comparison at all. Um, it is, uh, this is really over the top. And it has gotten the attention of OSHA, um, the number of injuries and deaths. But it's just a, a logistical nightmare. The, all of these wells are all over rural America. So they would need an army of regulators to go out for this thing, uh, these things. And the frackers are not self-reporting correctly. The number one way that we really learn about practices on the frack field are from the workers that are coming off of the frack field that are getting injured and, and sick becoming sickened. So in Pennsylvania, there's a bunch of workers that are now fractivists that are going around talking about their stories and the fact that they weren't told uh, anything about uh, the radioactivity, they weren't told what chemicals, if they asked for any sort of uh, masks or any sort of respirators, they were, they were fired. It, it's just really kind of brutal and there's nobody um, mining the ship. ship. Okay. Excuse me, the ship. All right. Now, is there anybody else who has a question who hasn't already asked a question? Charlie. Yeah, uh, Dr. Laura, I noticed there isn't a lot of the soil shipped by rail. Yeah. And wouldn't that benefit the infrastructure in the United States and environmentally friendly transportation? Sure, if they wouldn't blow it up. In Illinois. If they wouldn't blow up, it would be fantastic. It's the blowing up that's the problem. Crude oil does not burn. Yeah, I understand. It's so full of volatile organic compounds. It has a very high percentage of methane, and it has a very high percentage of the other volatile organic compounds. So they they are literally blowing up. And there is um, it is it is taken it is absolutely caught the attention of the Department of Transportation and. BSNF. What? What? Um, yeah, they just bought 
um, just uh, thousands of new rail cars that are more structurally sound than what they're trying to ship the um, the oil in now. And so they so even the railways are saying something has to ha has to be done because it's just unsafe. All right. Is there anybody else who has a question who hasn't already asked a question? All right. Uh, all right. I didn't see any hands up, but um, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, sure. Laura. First of all, um, what is the what is the main? Now, I guess the fracking is used for both oil and for natural gas. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep. Now, I, I want I think most of us know what oil is is mainly used for, but I wanted to ask you, what is the main use of natural gas? Natural gas is, uh, has a lot of uses. Of course, it's the heating and uh, you know the um, uh, cooking of you know, but also plastics. Natural gas is uh, has a, a production in plastic. They liquefy natural gas, so it's liquid natural gas, and that is um, propane and all sorts of other um, volatile gases that uh, also heat homes. Um, they brewing. Brewing, wine making, I hear. Uh, they use a lot of natural gas because they need an even flame for that. So that would be, you know, good for natural gas. So we are going to need some natural gas for some processes. And it's also used for power plants. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. What's happening with the power plants is this, okay? They say that the coal, this natural gas, our glut of natural gas is... Uh, displacing coal, but that's not the, tr the truth. There are, in Illinois at least, the strip mining in coal has actually increased, and what they're doing is they're sending it to China. So there's a great export uh, increase, export of uh, the coal in China. We are building liquid uh, natural gas plants for electricity here in the U.S., but they are not cleaner than coal, okay? If they're leaking methane, they're not cleaner than coal for the climate, so you can forget about that. And um, what they're, what's happening is, the one good thing that's happened because of all this fracking is that we're, um, because of the economics of the gas being cheap and very plentiful right now, that we're displacing nuclear power. Nuclear power is one of the most expensive electricities that we produce. So those plants are, going, are closing, right? Exelon just announced that they're closing 10 plants. So nuclear power is being displaced because uh, natural gas is cheaper um, to create electricity with, but we are not doing anything for the climate. Okay. Uh, Throw that. Your dinner was heated by natural gas. Oh, I don't doubt that. Yes. But uh, yes. I would. I would. Wait, wait. wait. Uh, now, now, I wonder. Just, just as a brief follow-up. Okay. I wonder if you could. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the, the liquid, liquefied natural gas plants that have blown up. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. So the, the same. Plants. The same thing with um, liquid nat natural gas has to be under pressure. So all of this is pressurized, you guys. So it's volatile organic compounds and it's uh, pr under pressure. And that uh, it leads to a situation where we can get blowouts. And you've seen them around the country, okay? Not only have the liquid natural gas plants blown up and the, tr the trains blown up, but also just gas pipelines, just infrastructure, right? The very famous blowout in, um, uh, outside of San Francisco that took, I think, 50 houses with it, right? So all of this is volatile organic compounds under pressure, and they're highly uh, flammable and highly explosive. That was in San Bruno. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was the, one of the biggest blowouts that we've had All right. All for right. about natural All right. gas. Now, I want to ask if, uh, now, are there, uh, we're going to go into rebuttals in about five minutes, but in that five minutes remaining, are there any, does anybody else have another question? Uh, yes, sir. Um, as I understand it, one of the real problems is the federal government's uh, exemption, if you will, on the uh, oil companies of having to disclose the, the volatile mixtures in these fracking uh, substances. Yep. But um, aside from the federal government level regulation, local state governments uh, must have their own uh, approaches to these. For example, lawsuits being filed by people who have been injured or property damaged. How are the local states responding to discovery requests 
for information about the, uh, the fracking. So right, okay. So every state is really different. Some states are kind of slowly stepping up to the plate. Like I told you, West Virginia is saying, wait a minute, this is radioactive and we're going to force you to do something serious about this water. Okay, so it depends on what aspect of the fracking you're talking about. When we wrote our bills, we did a kind of a survey of kind of the best state um, laws in each area that we could find. So um, every one is a, a little bit different, but I will tell you, um, for the majority of aspects, you want to know what community just passed the best uh, regulatory bill in the nation? Dallas, Texas. Because they know fracking. And they have 1,500 foot setbacks. They've got serious insurance required from these guys. The frackers, uh, after that got passed by the city council, they said, oh, this is a ban on fracking. Yeah, you bet you. Because the Dallas city council was going to make them pay for their damages and their environmental um, degradation by uh, very serious amounts of insurance. I, our bill in the General Assembly, we took those insurance levels and put it in our bill. <laughs> All right. Now, sir, do you have a question? Yeah. In that reference to, I uh, might mention Dick Cheney and the Clean Air and Clean Water Bill. There was restrictions or, or exemptions put in. We, we now know what, what the catastrophe is with this. Why is this administration, the EPA, or the DOE saying, these, these things have to be relooked. Why isn't that? Why can't that be rewritten? Yeah, it absolutely. So the Halliburton loopholes are in many of the federal laws: the Clean Water, the Clean Air, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Superfund uh, site, and many exemptions carved out for the oil and natural gas companies. And um, let's face it, Obama's bought off. There's no question about that. And many of our reps and senators are bought off by the oil and natural gas companies. They own them. You know, the bankers are right in there, too. The um, Chase um, and also Goldman Sachs are heavily involved in financing some of these operations. So they're all working together. And we really need to clean house in Congress, or else we're not going to get anything at that level. That's why we're working so hard at the state level. And let me tell you, at the state level, they're bought off. Mike Boss, Representative Mike Boss, openly was pushing for this uh, regulatory bill so fracking could start because he owns a trucking company. And he literally told people in the press that he was going to make uh, you know billions of dollars on the fracking. So come on, let's get this bill going. That is incredible that a sitting representative, we were down there and we were saying that representative needs to recuse himself from this vote. But that, that doesn't happen in Illinois. So a lot of money is being spread around. But I will tell you that the local folks, the mayors and the county officials and the fire, Illinois fire marshal and the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, there are people in Illinois that are getting very concerned about this. So it's not everybody. It's just those, you know, corrupt politicians. And I will tell you that every, all the politicians from like Peoria South, forget about them. <laughs> They need to be replaced, okay? And many of them up here. I want you to know that Senator Harmon has been sitting on our bills. He finally released them um, last yesterday. He finally released them. Yeah, exactly. Because we we went to his challenger in Oak Park, and we said, you know, he didn't know. He's a he's a Cook County defender. He's running against uh, Harmon. He's a great guy, right? And he didn't know anything about fracking. And we started feeding them some information about the $60,000 that Harmon took from the oil and natural gas companies, right? And he uh, came out for a moratorium, and he presented it on Monday at a debate in Oak Park. And like two days later, our bills came out of assignments. So we need challengers for all of these. I'm telling you, legislators are like apples. You let them sit in one place too long, they get rotten. And we need to change them out. All right. Uh, all right. Let's have a warm round of applause for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to get into the rebuttal period now. Uh, so before we start the rebuttals, I just want to have a show of hands. How many people would like 
Uh, by the way, first of all, let me explain briefly. These are the on deck chairs. If you want to have a rebuttal, have a rebuttal speech, just sit, just come over here and have a seat, like Mike is sitting here, and uh, and you'll be seated in the order closest to the chair, closest to the podium first. Now, that being said. Uh, how many people would like to give a rebuttal speech? Everybody who wants to give a rebuttal speech, raise your hand. Keep them hands up, folks. Okay, now it's uh, one, two, three, four, five. Keep your hands up, people. Six. Okay. Uh, what about you, Charlie? Yeah. Okay, that's seven. Okay. Okay, I count, and, and eight for Laura, so I count eight people so about, far. About and nine, uh, sir, uh, okay, uh, okay, I count nine piece, people Don. so far. What? About four minutes. No, wait a minute, no, oh, okay, well, you're a faster, no, no, that, no, Tim, we've got enough time for five minutes for everybody. Okay. Five minutes, five minutes top. Of course you can go for less than five. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to extend it. Normally we end at 9, but I got permission from the restaurant to run a little over until 9.30, so everybody will have adequate time to speak. Uh, so it'll be five minutes per person, folks. So again, uh, these are the on-deck chairs, so uh, let the rebuttals begin. <laughs> Okay, Is everybody, it, turn, everybody turn chicken? No, uh, if nobody's going first, I'll go first. All right, let the cameraman yeah. give his rebuttal speech. All right, first of all, I'm going to tell you something. You ain't going to get enough power through renewables. You ain't going to get enough power through the things. I agree with everything Dr. Laura is saying about the... Uh, about our world and about our trouble with the environment and especially with the great links they're going to get fossil fuels from but you know we are over and you know with this and even with the views on nuclear power the way she's uh, been doing the way we've been doing it today is absolutely horrendous but when i can pick up a glass like this and see our entire lifetime's worth of energy needs in a glass this size, full of something called thorium, I think it's well worth looking at. Especially when the technology was proven in the late 60s. There's something called the molten salt thorium reactor. As a matter of fact, the very inventor, Alvin Weinberg, of the light water reactor called nuclear power in its present form, a Faustian bargain. He wanted to come up with a much safer, much cleaner form of it. And I'm afraid that it is coming because this is the only real way that I think we're going to find and power our energy-hungry world. We have to get these up. A, a, a reactor the size of this restaurant could power almost the entire north side of Chicago, which means you don't have infrastructure, you don't have, uh, you don't have the roads, you don't have the thing. And every 30 years, about a truckload of waste would come out of it. And if it's done right, it will only be, to be sequestered for about 400 years. Now, you think that's crazy? With yeah. what we're doing now, yeah. with what we're doing now, it's it's a lot crazier not to use this stuff. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm going to invite all of you guys to take a look at something called the Thorium Energy Alliance. What they do is describe a world where this stuff or all these energy problems can get solved, where we can actually be off of fossil fuels in less than 50 years, and these claims, are they fantastic or preposterous? You really should take a good look at it because I'm telling you, I started looking at this stuff about two to three years ago. I was intrigued and there is an answer out there. And if we don't find the answer here in the US, there's over 300 research scientists right now in China working on this very problem to fix. This thorium nuclear revolution is gonna happen. And it'll probably happen within the next 20 years. I just hope the United States is at the forefront and owns the intellectual property on it so we're not paying again not only oil companies but perhaps foreign entities for the very thing that we started, that we researched, that we did in the mid-60s. Now, you don't believe me? I don't think you will. Take a good look at the Thorium Energy Alliance's webpage. 
take a look at the YouTube videos out there, and take a look at some of the other things. I think it is well worth looking at. I think there's a viable alternative. I think we can get it cheaper than coal. I think we can absolutely power this planet on clean, burning, nuclear power of an advanced reactor type. Thank you. I already have. <laughs> and that's right. exactly what you get when you have a light water reactor technology, Charlie. It's Fukushima. If we, if they were running molten salt thorium hey, reactors, you wouldn't have the Tim, problem. Tim, you don't have the podium anymore. Let Andrew talk. <laughs> I set my own timer, so we get five minutes, right? Uh, yeah. I'll watch it. Um, I thank Tim for alerting us to the fact that some people are not old enough to remember what all of us are old enough to remember, that we were once sold on a whole generation of reactors that were going to be clean, safe, and too cheap to meter. And it's turned out to be, as Forbes magazine put it in 1985, at that point, the largest managerial industrial disaster in human history. Uh, today, there's ten times more knowledge piled on that, showing that uh, the idea, the idea that uh, nuclear power can solve our problems, is promoted by industry and by uh, earnest, well-meaning people that haven't had time to study the evidence. The evidence is clear. Um, at one time, there was a sharp debate among people in certain Catholic church congregations about whether they had a problem with a priest because not everybody knew about it. Now, today, you can't have that debate. At one time, people debated whether the earth was flat around 800 years ago. It's flat. Today, uh, with telescopes, you got pictures from the space shuttle and all kinds of other stuff. Now it moves forward in the direction of truth. And there's an article back there uh, talking about the revolution that's happened in the last 15 to 20 years in all kinds of renewables. Uh, since 1979 in this area, the Chicago press has not been covering the houses out in Schaumburg with no furnace that he for 10 bucks a month. They started building houses in this area in 1979 that have no furnace at all. Tiny heating system because if you live in a house with good walls and windows that don't lose heat, you don't need a furnace. It's that simple. Dr. Laura tonight gave a tremendous summary of all kinds of evidence that you can make a simple statement after looking at what she presented and, and a few others. This mountain of evidence shows that anyone at the age of 7th or 8th grade with what's considered normal values of decency and common sense would vote to shut down the entire fracking industry today. I'll make a few observations really quick here. I think that fracking, the, the body of evidence shows that fracking has nothing to do with energy independence. It's about money and bribes to politicians and bribes to people that run companies like Dick Cheney's Halliburton. Also, why is depleted uranium being used rather than other explosives? Well, depleted uranium contaminates the air, water, and ground and makes the area uh, unlivable for humans. Uh, it makes water tables un unusable. Fracking destroys the drinking water, creating a new gold rush. The, one of my main points is fracking is used, I think main goal of the frackers is to create a new market in clean water after they destroy water wells and everywhere else. You can't live over land the, you know, the livestock can't live there if there's no access to water that's not going to kill you. So they're, they're developing a gold market. Fracking can be decide, disguised also, I think, as a method for toxic waste disposal where they used to have to pay to dispose of toxic waste. Now they're calling it proprietary chemicals that they're pumping into the wells. Wells all over rural America destroying the water tables. I think you can say, if you're beyond the age of seventh grade and you have normal common sense, this is a crime against the earth and a crime against humanity of biblical proportions. These frackers should be considered criminals, not corporate executives or people running a business. 
they are criminals. Massive crimes are involved. The energy, as I said, the energy efficiency revolution and the green revolution could eliminate the need for fracking. Harvey Wasserman, Harvey Wasserman published a book in 2007 called Solartopia. He laid out all the options. He said by 2030, that was 23 years, by 2030, the America, that's 16 years from now, America could be running with no coal, no oil, no gas, and no nukes, and we would save a couple trillion dollars in the process. That's where we are, and the major media, I see uh, my time has run up, so I'll, I'll finish here in 10 seconds. The major media, you know from my speeches in the past about coordinated blackouts, the media in America maintains us in a bubble of ignorance. They promote a myth, and they simultaneously black out all the scientists. So uh, we need to help Dr. Laura and all the others that are trying to spread the knowledge on this. It's a, it's a disaster of biblical proportions. And the alternatives are here. We have alternatives all over the place. Thank you. Thanks again, uh, Dick Sheeney and Halliburton. <laughs> but uh, Laura, thanks for this. Uh, thanks for this uh, show. These last two weeks have been really uh, wonderful. It's very, very good. You really uh, thought this bill and uh, putting a face on oil. So um, an ugly face on oil. So uh, keep up the, the great fight here. And um, I just, you know, want to say that, you know, it is a lot about money. There's railway age. <laughs> they are so excited about shipping more oil domestically. Yeah, exactly. And we got Obama jumping around giddy and telling <laughs> the folks that how uh, independent we are with oil. So, you know, are we supposed to be happy about this? And we got to keep Tim happy so we can his a scion $4 a gallon gas. So I think this is what it's about. We don't. This is for keeping uh, uh, airlines uh, from being bankrupt again, because most of their cost is jet fuel, and keeping Tim happy and your your kind of guys with cheap gas. So, so you know, it's all about the oil. Whereas, by the way, the New York Chicago bullet train runs on electricity. Hopefully, windmills and. Charlie's. So get to know us, get to love us. <laughs> Don't use any oil at all. But uh, that's about all I have to say. And uh, yeah, again, this is uh, fracking and oil sands and tar shale and spills in the Gulf and in the polar. And oil is so nasty. It's so much worse than natural gas and coal. And it's uh, really great that this is has an ugly face. The uh, frackers, and the uh, Tar, tar sands people. And one is one of the point I wanted to make. And oil, oil launches a thousand ships. You know, it's the only thing we go to war for anymore. Um, so uh, that's about it. Good job. It's a good couple weeks of uh, oil shows. <laughs> something about how free energy was going to, to free us all from uh, uh, the need for uh, thorium. Uh, but uh, well, I'll, we'll have to wait for that discussion, I guess. Uh, but the... Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, private corporations for uh, private profit are, are running our society, and that's why the uh, need for uh, public accountability, uh, the uh, incentives for uh, those who are nominally uh, responsible 
to the public and uh, uh, who are concerned uh, with uh, the public welfare uh, are they, they, they simply are, are bought and sold. Uh, I mean, they have to just to be in office, they have to uh, have a, a huge amount of support and uh, be acceptable uh, to uh, very uh, uh, media and uh, uh, various constituencies that are entrenched in uh, political life. Uh, they all know where their bread is buttered. Uh, how do we do something different? Uh, our society needs a revolution, a social revolution, an economic revolution, where the uh, profits of the society, that is, of all the uh, technological improvements that uh, uh, people and gender uh, to uh, save themselves uh, and each other uh, time and energy um, go to the public uh, uh, and are controlled by the public, uh, pub various publics, uh, worker-owned uh, uh, cooperatives, uh, uh, of democratic, a democratic society, uh, a, a one uh, where everybody's interests are respected. That's a much more human society. Uh, I hope that uh, you will uh, reflect on the wealth of uh, of efforts that have been made in the, the uh, general social democratic socialist movements uh, and not be uh, uh, blindsided by the anti-democratic uh, uh, Bolshevik movement uh, that uh, seized power and uh, uh, made the uh, democratic uh, movements uh, illegal and uh, suppress them. Uh, that's the kind of uh, kind of thinking that I see uh, something of in uh, the News and Letters organization uh, of Marxist humanists. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, you will inquire into uh, that kind of possibility and uh, support the freedom movements that make for a more human society in, uh, in, the, in the future. Thanks, Charlie. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Dr. Laura very much for your extremely informative presentation. It just about made me sick, though. <laughs> In fact, it almost literally made me sick. Um, this kind of business is, is really totally uh, ridiculous. Uh, as Andy said, uh, people with common sense, which is most people, even children, can see that this is crazy. And as you said many times, this is crazy. It is just out and out crazy. And it can't be allowed. It's, it's like a living hell. So my take on it is, uh, what exactly is the problem? Uh, the problem isn't that people don't know that this is crazy. Okay, I think anybody examining this, not anybody, because certain people obviously take the other side, but most people examining this will recognize that it can't be allowed. So uh, my take is that the problem is that the people in power um, that we have in power are the wrong kind of people. There are a certain class of people who are wealthy, uh, business-related, business people are business-related, and the profit has gotten to their heads. The, the power and the profit and the money has gotten to their heads. And they, they also have to be bought off. Like the last speaker said, they, they're bought and sold. So we really need a, an entirely new system of government if we want to uh, avert these kinds of, this, kind, this kind of craziness. And that's what democracy is supposed to be about. 
That's what real democracy is about. But we don't have that in this country. So uh, that's just about uh, all I want to say. And again, check out our website, democracyfortheusa.org, which we get into this question of what kind of system do we actually have. Thank you. Next. No, no, no. Who's, uh, just a moment. There's more coming. Let's get the next anybody rebutter. Have, anybody else want to make give a rebuttal? Charlie? Yeah, I'm tired of this. Go. Oh, no. Sir, you want to? Wait a minute. Please, come on up. I'm going to up there. I'm going to say. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Capitalism forever. Hey, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Laura for an excellent presentation there. A uh, couple of points. First of all, I read uh, James, uh, Richard Martin's uh, Superfuel also. Uh, and it's an extremely impressive book. Unfortunately, I, I felt obligated to talk to some people from the Union of Concerned Scientists who I think are, are pretty okay. uh, good watchdogs on nuclear. And they said it ain't as rosy as he paints out. So not that we shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. research. I, I think we absolutely should. The Chinese are doing a lot of research. The Indians have got a whole project going on. I believe there's actually a project going on in Illinois. There is. There's a, there's a private there's a research reactor being built down there somewhere. It doesn't say thorium in the act, but I, I rather strong suspect it is a thorium reactor based on the on the thing. So let's keep our fingers crossed. But it, it, it probably won't be as good as Richard Martin made it out. There's a lot of there's a lot that needs to be done yet. I agree. A lot, a lot of research needs to be done. Yeah, it's a, it's a, there was a good reason why they chose, a bad reason why they chose uranium in the first place, right. so they could make bombs out of it. Right. It was Rick Hover and his, his crooks there, wanted to make bombs, they didn't give a damn what ever happened, so long as they got their bombs out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the pollution that comes with it, they didn't care. They just stuck it in Hanford and they, they leak. And they didn't care. So uh, hopefully it was another alternative, because it would be nice to have a base load system you could rely on at night. Right. And, uh, the, the winds are blowing at night better than they are in the daytime. And if we had a decent, uh, decent uh, grid, we could move things around a little better. It just, it just needs to augment renewables. Yeah, okay. So anyhow, the, the thing I really wanted to talk about a little bit more is the um, the points that uh, Laura made about the um, the IDNR and the uh, the really piss poor job that they've done in trying to produce the regulation because. The act that was there, although it had its weaknesses, it was a whole lot stronger than the regulations that come out to enforce it. I'll give you a couple of ideas. Um, in the act, or the bill, the, 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 the law, there's something like a 400 item list that they are supposed to check for uh, before and after drilling a well to see if any of those substances show up in the after that weren't there in the before uh, samples. And if they are, there's a presumption that the fracking industry is the one that caused the problems. The, the regulations that came out, they're only going to test for 25 uh, chemicals, I think it's 25 chemicals, something like that. You know, So as long as and they're, they're identified, so if the fracking industry knows what they're going to look for, guess what, they've got 400 or so, or 2,000 items to choose from, they'll choose other ones than those 25 items. You know, so um, yeah, that's one example of extreme weakness. The other thing they, they, that's in the act that's, that's pretty strong is it says that um, all waste water coming up from the wells must be kept in tanks, not in, in pits lined or otherwise, except in emergency situations. It allows in the act only one week to keep things in these uh, pits, those are in emergencies. The way the regulations are written, you can keep it there for a week until after all activity on that well has stopped. We have, how many years are they going to be drilling the same well down and pumping in different directions? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a regulation which has absolutely no teeth in it at all. Uh, the fines for these things are less than the cost of parking out in the street tonight. They catch you parking without your ticket there, they'll, cost, they'll charge you more for your parking ticket, they will charge a fracker for doing an awful lot of the things that uh, really need to have million dollar fines, not thousand, hundred dollar <coughs> fines, or fifty dollar fines like they have in the act. It's just disgusting. Uh, the proximity to, to um, housing, you made an excellent point about the fact that these things explode and take a half a mile, and yet we're 100 yards away from somebody's house, and they didn't have any choice about that. So that's a, another ridiculous thing. Um, fracking on the national parks, fortunately, is being dealt with a little bit. Um, timely release on information. People don't get injured just in the daytime, 9 to 5. You get injured from these explosions any time of the day and night, or you know, from being doused with a leak from water, and yet they only um, allow for um, 
answers to questions from nine to five, and uh, it says uh, uh, if anything else called a fracker and doesn't have, you have no idea how the fra who the fracker was. You, know, the, 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 you can just drive a, a fracking truck through these regulations. They are so completely inadequate, and that was um, you know it really does need to be changed. Okay. Um, I think the one of the things you got to keep an eye out oh, well, this, on these on the regulations, we've got to write our congressmen, the, the, the senate, the uh, the uh, governor, anybody else you can think of, write them letters, call them, and besiege them with requests. Because unless they hear from hundreds of thousands of us, they don't give a damn. They'll just keep on going the way they are now and plead ignorance. Um, the regard to export to Europe, the fiasco going on in U Ukraine at the present moment is 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 ramping up the pressure for approval of these liquid natural gas export uh, terminals so they can get the uh, get Europe, which has already cut down its use of Russian gas to a 30% like of what it uses, and actually has a really good supply available to it from the Middle East, and could uh, possibly um, go on the way. But anyhow, they are using this as an excuse to try and get permission. Thank you. I'm Michael Foley. I'm glad I was here to hear this lecture. And I was glad to hear Dr. Lord talk about the enormous amounts of money. At the end of her lecture, she talked about the enormous amounts of money the giant companies spread around Congress in the form of campaign contributions. It's not often the speakers really mention that, but it's, it's becoming just more and more obvious to even casual observers of the news. It's becoming more and more obvious even casual observers of the things that happen in this country. With large, powerful interests to pay off the congressmen, both houses, and also uh, elected officials at all lower levels of government, city and uh, state government. Uh, you don't have to take her word for it. You don't have to take my word for it. The one I remember was, I believe it was 2010. It was early on in uh, Barack Obama's first term. There was some kind of bill in the Congress that was going to the banks. The banks didn't want this bill to be enacted into law. I don't remember what it was about. But the banks were opposed to it, and the banks, the bank lobby, made sure anybody who was in favor of that bill had an opportunity to talk. This bill went before every campaign, uh, every committee and subcommittee in both houses. Anybody that was in favor of this bill got to go talk to the congressman and tell them they wanted the bill passed. And this went on for two weeks. The banks did not want, excuse me, the banks did not want anybody complaining that the banks kiboshed the bill or kiboshed people in favor of the bill. Anybody that was in favor of this bill had a chance to talk. This went on for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, the House and the Senate both voted and they voted overwhelmingly against the bill, just like the banks wanted. And at the end of it all, Senator Dick Durbin, the guy from Illinois, our boy in Congress, he was at a press conference and the, the reporter said, what happened? And Senator Durbin said, well, the banks owned this place. Those were his words, the banks owned this place. And he was talking about the United States Congress, House and Senate, and he was not complaining. He was stating a matter of fact. The banks own this place. And it's not just them. It's any large group oil companies. There's one of them that was mentioned tonight. Another thing I heard on the news, on the, well, it wasn't on the news, it was a radio talk show. I heard it within the last couple of months. Somebody was talking about the XL pipeline. How come Obama won't uh, approve the XL pipeline? Blah, 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 blah. And it was said that Warren Buffett, who is a big Democratic buddy, Warren Buffett either owns that railroad or owns a large piece of that railroad. The Burlington Northern Santa Fe is transporting this, this oil. And when, if and when the XL pipeline would go through, this railroad would lose a lot of business. Now, I don't know if that story is true or not, but that was said Warren Buffett owns a large piece of that railroad, and he's Obama's buddy. Anyway, that's all I got. Thank you. And thank you, Doug. Okay. All right. Anybody else who anybody else want to give a rebuttal speech? Nope.
All right. All right. Well, I will. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'll give a I'll give a brief rebuttal speech. Can you time me, Tim? Yes, I will. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Oh, excuse me. Uh, oh, uh, one pool at a time. All right. All right. Now. Uh, all right. Now, I think uh, I'm still kind of hungry. So uh, actually, watching this presentation's made me hungry. So I'll tell you what. Uh, if Susan's here, I, I'll tell you I'd like to have a have a bowl of toxic stew uh, with a tall glass of nuke juice and a slice of yellow cake for dessert. <laughs> All right, that was delicious. Okay. All right, I think that this is this is really um, this this sounds like a really good program. Uh, right, I think this was a, this was a very good program I, tonight. Uh, she had a, there was a lot of information in here. Um, I think it would have. Uh, if you don't mind my saying so, I think it would have been better if uh, if you could have come on time. Uh, when you're, I when, thought when, it started at seven. Six per gathering. Okay, one, one, one pool at a time. You can you can you can bring that up in the in when you'll get the final word. Okay, then you can then you. Okay, well yep, yeah, one pool at a time, Laura. And, and, all right. All right. Now when you're because I just wanted to say that when you're trying to win people over, it it, it helps to be on time. It just makes a good impression, and. Um, now, you know this is um, this is a very serious issue, uh, and uh, um, and I think this was this was a I think this is a very good presentation. There was a lot of information packed into it. In fact, there was almost there was almost more than I could absorb. Actually, I mean there was a lot of stuff I hadn't heard before. Uh, for example, I, I didn't know what I didn't know what HFRA stands for. Or, IDNR or APGARS or IPCC or I, I don't know what APGARS means, IPCC or IEA, and, and I, I'm still not real clear on what dry gas is. So I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, and, and I don't suppose most people here are, but, I, but that would be interesting to know. Now one, now, one of the things that you did mention, Laura, is, is you mentioned uh, the national forest and what's being done in those. And, and I certainly don't like to see wilderness uh, torn up and turned into strip mines and clear cut and all the trees cut down. But the way they have the National Forest set up, it's, it's run not by the Department of the Interior like National Parks, it's actually run by the Department of Agriculture and, and the original purpose of the National Forest was logging. And, and so they have a very different mission than the National Park Service. It isn't really wilderness preservation. Uh, maybe, maybe we should be more focused on that, but in any case, we do have to realize that, that's, um, that they have a somewhat different mission. Now, the only other thing I would say in terms of uh, the, the rise in the crime rate at the, at the Bakken oil fields is quite, is, uh, that's quite real. Um, and I would, for anybody that's interested in what's going on at the Bakken, I would recommend the National Geographic article on it. Uh, which, which, uh, which Laura mentioned. There's, I would also add, however, that anytime you have a massive increase in population, uh, anytime there's more people, there's also going to be more crime. Um, now, however, um, that being said, uh, you know, I think that the, this is a very important issue because I think all of us would like to be able to drink clean water that doesn't catch on fire when you hold a match to it. <laughs> I think we would all like to be able to breathe air that doesn't contain um, that doesn't contain methane that doesn't contain large amounts of methane, for example, and or silica. Uh, and we all want these things. Even the chief executives of oil companies want don't want to have to live next to uh, next to a polluting site. Nobody wants that. And. And, and so I think, you know, we need to be concerned about these things. Now, now I would just say to, to Tim that you were, taught, you were saying that renewables cannot supply all of, all of our needs. No. Well, we're going to have to learn how to make them supply all of our needs because the non-renewable stuff is, gonna, is by definition going to run out. And one of the most important points that, doc, that, that Dr. Laura made tonight is that we are now scraping the bottom of the barrel as far as coal, oil, and natural gas. You consider some of the, the disasters we've had with fossil fuels recently. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico occurred because they're drilling deeper than is really safe to do so. 
So the, the low hanging fruit is already, is already gone. And in the case of natural gas, we have this fracking, which is causing, it's causing earthquakes, it, it's causing polluted watersheds. And, and again, they're doing this because the, the gas that was easy to acquire is already gone. And, in, and now in the case of coal, we have mountaintop removal mining. And why are they doing this? Because it would appear that my time is up. And, and so, and, and, but in any case, our time is up because we're, we're running out of coal, folks, and we better start looking for alternatives. You said to be nice to the He wasn't All right. I oh, don't pay attention to this, these guys. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for your presentation and your efforts to uh, save Illinois from these uh, pollutant polluters. I'm, just be brief, um, uh, a lot of people don't know the insatiable appetite of this nation for energy. <laughs> And some of you guys are railroaders would know this, but talking about coal, there's a four-track main line mm -hmm. to the coal fields in Wyoming. And those are found virtually nowhere in the United States. That means there's two tracks going, one for trains going in one direction and two the other. And that's just incredible, and there's a constant stream of unit trains of coal cars 24 hours a day seven days a week the four track main is is purchased. there's only one in the united states many years ago and the railroad used to advertise that they have there's one here in chicago uh, but it's very rare and this is this is the only thing that's shipped is coal there's no merchandise freight on these lines. This is strictly coal. And it's picking up one unit train and bringing it to a power plant, bringing back empties. You can go up to like 18th Street and watch some of this traffic. You go train watching. But um, the other thing I want to talk about, you mentioned this accident here. Actually, I'm acquainted with the guy who runs that railroad. And it was a, an unusual accident. Um, I maybe not bore you with railroad stories, but the engineer came to the end of his duty, his tour duty, and he parked the engine. He happened to be on a hill, and normally you leave the engine idling. Um, but there, later on, something like in the middle of the night, there was a fire in the engine, and they put the fire out, notified the railroad, and then the tra railroad train somehow went down the hill and crashed into the town in the, in the valley, which I've never been able to ascertain precisely how that accident happened because there's all sorts of mechanical safety features that that train would have been dead locked. I mean, if you take a semaphore, if there's no electricity of semaphore, it goes into a stop. If there's no power, what's the safeguards? built in the transportation industry, and I have no idea. Somebody's not talking. Um, the thing that happened in that one, I spoke about this last week, though. Tragically, the way they have tank cars, though, that when they cra crash like that, they all line up like sardines in a can, and so you get a big conflagration. Very dangerous. So, in one essence, there's this, they did this to, allegedly for safety reasons, yet it enhanced the conflagrations that you result in these kinds of accidents. But they're not talking about that. I can't figure out why that train didn't, the brakes didn't lock, and it just sat there, you know. Now the other thing, the last thing I'd like to talk about, and I, I'm a lobbyist for IVI and a few other things, is, and I've had occasion now to watch a lot of C-SPAN and uh, Political, it's amazing. People don't know the division, I don't think, that's really, really, really in between the energy people and the environmentalists. It's going on, it was going, it's going on this week. As a matter of fact, the Republicans hate the Environmental Protection Agency. And the other thing they hate 
is the uh, Department of Energy. They feel the Department of Energy and Russ's libertarian pals, they think it should be abolished altogether. There, there is a, such a division on this. The legislation that's pending right now is to strip the ability of the EPA to do environmental assessments. It's just incredible. And they are actually introducing legislation to this effect. Now, I presume that this permeates to the state and local level. But there is a real division regarding this, these kinds of things. And they will not listen to you. These energy people will not, there's, there's no negotiations. There's no middle ground on this. They feel that these are wonderful things and they dismiss any of these things, especially from some of these oil producing things. It's going to be the, I think coming up in the next election is going to be another issue in here. And they're going to try to uh, win public opinion one way or another in this regard. But it is a current issue. It's really, really, and these Republicans are, are bent. I think they're getting some strength because they control like the House, that they really think it's time to, to abolish entities uh, in the greenies and stuff like that. Are you here to police me? That's uh, right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have, have no enforcement. Yeah. College of Beat it. does. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Uh, well, thanks for the button. I want to tell you for the button. She gave me a button. This has got to be okay. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing all your stuff. You here. got it. You need a few bucks here as a donation for your... You, you paid my, uh, my dinner. Oh, all right. Okay, all so right. thank you so much. Dr. Laura, can I put you on a 10-minute clock? Okay, great. Um, okay, so number one, Charles told me that the presentation started at 7. That's why I was I was actually uh, early. I was ten minutes to seven. <laughs> we had uh, we had uh, um, action in Oak Park, and um, not an action. They they Oak Park had that one Earth Film Festival, and so we were really out there in Spades in Oak Park. And Senator Harmon is one of the gatekeepers for these issues. He presents himself as a progressive, but he really is a gatekeeper, and he's uh, um, he's taking a lot of money from the oil and natural gas companies. So we really want to push the Oak Parkers to be more um, vocal about this and more, you know, um, enlivened. So that was really important for us. Um, so that's number one. I wasn't late. I was early. <laughs> okay, number two. Um, APGARs are a, a measure of fetal well-being at birth. Um, and dry gas is methane. So just pure methane is called dry gas, okay? The IPCC is the Intergovernmental uh, Policy um, uh, Climate Commission. Inter Intergovernmental Policy uh, for on uh, climate change, I think, on climate change is the IPCC. It's a UN body of uh, sciences, scientists. And then I can't remember all the other acronyms. I was trying to get them down fast. Um, okay. I am so sorry, Tim. Where are you? Where'd you go? Gosh darn it. I'm waiting to... He, he's got to be... I want him to come in and I'm going to talk to him about this. That is blue pucky that we cannot get completely renewable. Wind is constant. If we go up and out, you guys, constant. Wind is baseload, up and out. They have inflatable wind turbines now that they're floating up and um, and getting wind constantly. Not, you know, 5,000 feet, not in the stratosphere, but just, you know, a couple hundred feet up. Wind is constant, and offshore, wind is constant. So wind can be baseload. And solar is um, our ability for the batteries are so uh, okay. is so acute now. There are so many, uh, they're actually making do you um, batteries out of um, no. two elements uh, of magnesium and ad, um, uh, what's it called? Acrimony? No, no, acrimony. Antimony. 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 So no rare earths, no rare earths, uh, readily available, long living, uh, holding a lot of charge, able to take massive charge batteries on, uh, you know, so that we don't even have to fight in Afghanistan for rare earths. So all that is bullpucky. You can drive your cars on electricity. Tesla is zero to 60 in two seconds, you guys. You can drive four, sorry. 
a very, very nice car on all electricity. We are developing the charging systems across America now where you can literally go across the country just all on our electricity. Hydrogen fuel cells are uh, advancing. I have seen videos of some yahoos out in Tennessee who drive their pickups on hydrogen. They got a little, uh, they got a little cell going on in the back of their truck and they pour some water in there and they can get a couple thousand dollars or a thousand miles on several gallons of water. It is not in the future, it is now. We could have it now. That is energy independence. Not hooking yourselves to some thorium reactor that is gonna be so costly that we can't afford any of the real renewables, but real honest to God, wind, solar, tidal, um, the algae, yeah, Tim, you are so off. Read something from Mark Jacobson, would you? I have. Up and out for wind becomes baseload, okay? And they're doing it all over the place. They, they, the largest solar um, uh, factory, solar collector in the world just um, started up in the Mojave. This is, we do not have to have this kind of, de uh, de you know, really devastation of our environment to drive our cars around. We can literally live a very similar lifestyle as we are right now on complete renewables. It can be done, but it's not going to be done unless every single one of us stand up because the oil and natural gas companies own Washington. They own most of Springfield. Now, do they have to? Can good people be elected to Congress? You betcha. Go and look how Alan Grayson got elected to Congress. Small donations from thousands of people, okay? Same with Dennis Kucinich. Same with Bernie Sanders. You do not have to sell out. They sell out because they're weak, and they are immoral, and they are unethical. So don't vote for them, okay? That's number one, one or two. Thank you. Um, don't vote for the lesser of two evils anymore. Vote for the people that will really fight because we are at the fighting stage. Now, we are a bunch of gray hairs here. You don't have too many gray hairs. You're, you're little. But we're all a little bit more uh, mature and wisdom. You know, we have more wisdom. The kids are not going to tolerate this. They're chaining themselves to equipment. They're blockading the, the frackers from coming into these places. Yeah. They, are, they are not driving. They are not eating meat. They are not flying because they know their future is at stake here. Most of us will be dead when South Florida goes underwater, but they're still going to be alive. And they are ready to fight. And I'm with them. Good. Okay? I'm with them because this is a fight over the planet. So we all need to just bump it up a little bit, okay? I personally have sworn off flying. I have not flown for over uh, 10 years. I am absolutely not gonna get into a plane. It is way too uh, gas consumptive. I do drive my car a little bit, but I'm very judicial about it. Charles goes everywhere on mass transit. I don't eat meat because it is too petroleum consumptive. There are millions of things that every single person here could do to cut down the use of oil and natural gas so that we can cut these guys out of our lives. And it really is a battle over the planet. If you don't think things are gonna change here in Chicago, think again. We are gonna be a hotbed of malaria here in Chicago if we reach four degrees. That lake out there will be 10 feet down and we will have water um, rationing and rather scarcity because there's so many millions of people here. So think again if you think you're not going to get affected. This is a fight and this is a fight with all of us. Now if all of us fight, we win. Yeah. I will tell you right now, we win. So please join the fight, okay? Right. Here is, um, here's our green, uh, 13, our green 13, okay? Those are our bills. We got a bill for everything. Call and bug your Illinois rep and senator to death, okay? At my experience is that I, every time you push back, they, they give a little bit. They give a little bit. And we may not get everything that we want, but we do get something, okay? So I guarantee you, three of these bills might be able to be passed. 
We don't know which three just yet. We're still working on that, okay? Working, the, working one local government off of another, okay? But I will guarantee you that we might be able to do something like that if we push back fast, uh, hard enough, if we make it an election issue. And um, I just really want to encourage you, it's absolutely criminal what they're doing. They're poisoning the groundwater and the aquifer. If we did that, if you dumped a bunch of poison in your neighbor's uh, you know, backyard and poisoned his water well, you would be a criminal. You would have to go to jail. And they're not, okay? Um, let me see. The national forests. National forests are an economic driver. Who, I think, who said about the national forests, okay? They are, okay. Most of the national forests now, because our wildlands land, have uh, diminished so greatly, there is a huge tourism around our national forests about hiking and ecotourism and camping. The, all of this is going to be displaced. How many people are going to go down the Shawnee National Forest and hike with their family when there's compressors and the smell of benzene in the air? Okay? Give me a break. That we are going to lose as many jobs as we create because of, because of that. So all of these forests are really, really important to us as tourism, as eco-destinations, not just the timber, okay? We can replace all that timber with hemp. All we need to do is just grow the gosh darn stuff, okay? Um, uh, market for clean water. You are absolutely right about that. They are poisoning the water, and then they're going to sell you back clean water. The Department of Energy and GE have a program now. They're building a, a center where they're going to um, clean the heavy metals and the radioactivity out of this water. It's going to cost them a fortune, and then they're going to sell it back to you as with a premium. There's no question about that. None. They're already in the midst of it. Um, okay, wind at night. Um, open pits. Let me see. 20 years. Okay, we only have 20 years of fossil fuel. That's the kicker about this thing. We're going to let them destroy our farmland, our water, and our aquifers, and we only have 20 years max of fossil fuels. So we're going to be in the same situation 20 years that we are right now, which means we have to get renewable. Period. So why let them devastate our, our environment when we have to go to renewable? And I guarantee you, I'm serious, in the next presidential run, don't vote for Hillary. Would you please vote for Bernie Sanders? He's coming out. We must just refuse to vote for these fossil uh, fools, okay? Anybody that you think is um, tainted is tainted. Don't vote for them. And vote for the Green Party. There's going to be Green candidates in a lot of the races. Vote for, come on, vote for even, even if they don't have that much experience. I will tell you, the number one thing that the people in Springfield have experience in is being corrupt. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Vote for South You can vote. You can vote for me. Or for us. Uh, please. 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 Please.